So now that we've learned what happened in the Wild West or out in the West during and right after the Civil War, uh, now we're going to talk about what was happening in the cities uh, right after the Civil War. Now that the actual battles of the Civil War and then the uh, political battles of Reconstruction were kind of over with, um, the country was ready to move on. They were ready to move on to, uh, you know, bigger and better things when it came to business. And so um, they went through what's known as an industrial revolution. An industrial revolution just means that you are moving from, like, uh, animal and man-powered machines to uh, machines that are powered by other types of fuels. And so, you know, things that are powered by coal and steam and gasoline and things like that. And so this endeavor, why was why were they ready for this industrial revolution because they had all of these things going for them first off out in the west they had found all kinds of resources it wasn't just gold that they were finding out there they also found coal and iron and lead and copper and all of these things that they could use in their factories um, also in the west in the pacific northwest there was tons of lumber they found these huge forests that had plenty of lumber to build buildings and different things with um, Third of all was that the government was trying to help out businesses. They were trying to get biz businesses bigger and create more jobs for Americans by doing that. So what they were doing were they, they were giving them land. So things like railroads and other businesses, they were literally giving them massive chunks of land uh, to create their businesses with and make money off of. And last of all, they rose the tariffs. And so they made the tariffs larger, which of course makes... Uh, products from companies outside of the U.S. more expensive and then relatively of course makes the local goods cheaper and so by making foreign goods more expensive you make the local goods cheaper which allows you to um, to have the local companies make more money and so all of these things had the country ready for an industrial revolution so a couple of the big money-making resources were steel and oil, a couple of the big industries. And so uh, we'll start off, start off talking about steel. And steel, it, you know, it was really difficult to make, and so it was mostly made in other countries. Um, but it, then the Bessemer process was created. And the Bessemer process uh, was a way, a method to make stronger steel for cheaper. And so what they could do is they could take the molten iron, you know, whatever iron you had, and you could put it into one of these big uh, furnaces down here, and then you would blow air through it. And as you were blowing air through it, um, it would remove the impurities. It would remove the stuff that wasn't um, iron that wouldn't make the steel stronger. And so... Um, it, it was a really, really easy way of doing this, and so a lot of American companies started to be able to um, make this work for them. And so uh, steel started to replace iron for building materials because it was way, way stronger, and everybody knew that from the very beginning, but it was so expensive before that not very many people were using it. And so now that steel was cheaper, people could use it. And so um, very quickly, one of the capitals of the world for steel became pittsburgh and so pittsburgh was there was steel made all over the place and it became this major major place um, and the reason was because there were coal mines nearby and there was good transportation with uh, a couple of railroads coming in there as well as three rivers meeting up in that same spot and that allowed um, pittsburgh to be a really really good steel town and so um since then the nfl team is even named after that because the steel industry was so important that they even named their nfl team the steelers so no it doesn't mean like thieves it doesn't mean people that steal things from other people it means uh people that worked in the steel industry uh the other thing we'll talk about is the oil in titusville pennsylvania another pennsylvania place the first oil strike happened and um, some people were drilling and they found some oil and they realized that they could use this oil for lubricants they could use it for fuels they could use it for all these different things that could be used with the machinery and so because it had so many uses it was really really valuable and so it was known as black gold because it was even though it was black liquid it was as valuable as gold
one of the other major industries at the time was railroads. And so railroads were really, really big business as well. And the railroads were carrying people out to the west. And it was easy to get to the west now instead of having to get in a wagon and risk all kinds of different things. Instead, you could get into a train and it'd be a pretty comfortable um, ride out to the west and then of course those trains would turn around and they would carry raw materials back to the factories and fill up those factories in the east so that the eastern factories can make money and so these railroads became huge business where they were starting to make sleeping cars and dining cars where you could sleep while you're going across the country and you could um, you know stop and eat like like it was a restaurant as you're going across too um, and they were putting down lots and lots of new track and these railroads started to consolidate and consolidate essentially means that you start to combine into one company so one company is starting to buy up all of the other companies and the idea was to keep the competition low and be able to keep the prices high because if you're going against somebody else if you're competing with somebody else then you kind of want to make sure that your prices are lower than the other people or at least the same as the other people so that you don't um, lose the business because people are going to pick the cheaper one and so if you don't have any competition if there's only one railroad then they have to pay whatever you want to charge and so the Pennsylvania Railroad is one example and the railroad in Pennsylvania bought up 73 countries by either bought a, or sorry companies either they bought them up or they forced them out of business and so um, they were able to drive the prices up in Pennsylvania and so um, the rates for moving grain went way, 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 way up. Okay, uh, The only thing that was happening is these big companies were giving secret good rates to their best customers. So their customers that were really big farmers that moved a lot of stuff would get a cheaper rate. And so the farmers started to join the grangers and the populace um, to try and control this, as we talked about before. At the same time, these businesses were blooming, inventions were happening all over the place. People stopped, finally were done with this whole fighting each other, and now they could focus on you know, making the country a better place. And so in the late 1800s, there were tons of new patents. And a patent, is definition right there, is a document giving someone sole rights. So they're the only ones that can make uh, and sell a, a specific invention. So America became known as the land of invention. As a matter of fact, in 1897, in one year, there were more new patents than in the 10 years before the Civil War. So it was a really, really high uh, amount of patents happening at the time. And Thomas Edison was one of the main reasons for this. Thomas Edison was known as the Wizard of Menlo Park because in Menlo Park, New Jersey, he set up a research lab where he got a ton of great scientists uh, to come in and help him invent things and, and come up with different things. And out of the Menlo Park lab, uh, the light bulb was invented, the video came the phonograph, all of these Thomas Edison was given um, credit for. However, all of these in, uh, all of these inventions were kind of worthless without some sort of clean, powerful energy source. And so the thing that really, really made this uh, a positive thing in the history of the U.S. was the first electrical power plant was invented by these inventors. And it was set up in New York City. And this started the age of electricity. It started the age where um, electricity was being used to power household items. So we'll talk about some other inventors. Um, one example is Alexander Graham Bell. Alexander Graham Bell uh, was thought, you know, all these different inventions and things are happening, but the telegraph is the best way we can communicate. And so you can instantly communicate a message through Morse code. However, he thought it'd be so much better if we could find an invention where we could transmit the human voice so you could actually hear the person that you're trying to send a message to so that you could talk to each other. Um, and so he invented the first telephone. And the first telephone was invented in his lab and he was in another room from his assistant whose name was Watson and what happened is they were researching this and researching this and working with it and trying to make it work and they were having a hard time um, and he was doing some experiments and he spilled some acid on his hand and so Alexander Hamilton quickly without thinking kind of picked up the telephone to call the other room and he said Watson come here I want you and it worked and so he needed the help 
with an acid and it actually ended up working and very very quickly it became a very popular invention one of the most popular ones um <clears throat> Within a few years, over 300,000 phones were bought and uh, found all around the country. Um, another inventor was Christopher Scholes. Christopher Scholes invented the typewriter, and he made office work very better or, or much better, where soon secretary was, secretaries were knocking out like 60 words per minute as they're um, typing out things for their bosses. Um, and also... Uh, George Eastman was an inventor who invented the first portable camera. So before this, there was pictures being taken. We know there were pictures taken in the Civil War, but it required hundreds of pounds of chemicals and equipment, which was very expensive and very difficult to move. And then there were the transportation inventions, and Henry Ford invented something. And it, a lot of people think Henry Ford invented the car. Now, he didn't invent the car. He didn't invent the car at all. There were plenty of cars happen, er, around. There were cars in America at the time. There were about 8,000 cars before Henry Ford even started making them. But what he did is he created a system to mass-produce cars. And the system to mass-produce cars is called the assembly line. And so instead of one person putting a car together piece by piece by piece by piece what he did is he put it on a conveyor belt and each person who was in the uh, factory would do a different job so maybe one guy would put wheels on and one guy would put the body on and one guy would put the engine in and it would move along and all you would do all day long was your one job you'd put on wheels so if your job was to put on wheels you'd put on wheels on a car and then you'd move it down the line and put wheels on the next car and so uh, people specialized and they became really, really good at making these. And so they can make the cars really super fast and that allowed them to be made for much cheaper. And so very quickly they became cheap enough for anyone to own because the production time was cut in half. So like I said, in 1900, there were 8,000 cars owned because they were so expensive and you had to import them from Europe. By 1917, just 17 years later, Four and a half million cars were owned because they were now affordable enough if you bought a Ford uh, Model T. All right, and so another transportation invention that a lot of people didn't care about at the time were, was uh, Wilbur and Orville Wright invented the first airplane. And so they were brothers. They were at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina is where they lived, and they were trying to create a gas-powered airplane. Now, on their first successful flight, they had a 12-second flight. It only went 12 seconds, and it went about 120 feet. Okay, so it went like one-third of a football field, not even half of a football field, is how long it went. So their longest flight, they took a few more flights that same day, and their longest one was under a minute, 59 seconds. So <clears throat> obviously it took a lot of work to make it like airplanes we have today, but it really was kind of useless. Nobody really used it for anything until World War I. Nobody cared about it or anything. But then after World War I, it would revolutionize transportation, and it's the reason that moving from place to place is so quick and easy. Uh, in today's world. So these new businesses, there were new business types that were allowing the rich people to make a whole lot of money. And one of these uh, types was a corporation. And a corporation is a business where stocks are owned. So it's a business where um, a lot of different people pay a little bit of money to become part owners. And so you own a small percentage of it. And the share that you own, that part of it that you own, is called your stocks. And so what it does is it allows you to get a certain percentage, whatever it is if you own two percent of the company you deserve two percent of their profits and so the good thing about owning stocks is it's really low risk because all you can lose in the stock market is the money that you put in so if you buy five hundred dollars worth of stocks all you can lose is that five hundred dollars they can't come and take your house or take your cars or take the property that you own whereas if you own your own business and you go in debt and things go bad then they can take away your business or your uh, own personal property and so it's a little higher risk uh, one of these people that got really really rich was jp morgan and jp morgan was a banker right he was a man who made a lot of money through banking because what he did is he made huge loans to these corporations and then <clears throat> 
with the interest he made a lot of money off of those loans then he used the money that he made off those loans and he bought struggling companies companies that were having a hard time he bought them for very cheap and then he would go there and he would buy up all the other companies because he had money that were in the same uh type of company he would buy all of them up and he would eliminate competition and then he would increase price profit and bring those companies to the top therefore making even more money off of them before he would either sell them out or continue uh, running them as a successful business these big businessmen were helped out a lot by the laissez-faire which we talked about when we talked about thomas jefferson and his approach and laissez-faire is the government having a hands-off approach to the economy and so um, they're they're saying we're not going to touch it we're going to let it be we're going to let them do whatever and so these giant corporations and monopolies were allowed to grow and get bigger and bigger and bigger because the government was saying we don't belong in the business world we're not going to talk business and so um, Andrew Carnegie was was one of these men that built a very very large business and he owned the largest steel company in the world at the time he was um, very very successful and the reason that he was successful was because of something called vertical integration and i believe you have to write this in your notes you need to know the words vertical integration and vertical integration is just all of this okay he was successful because he owned every single step of making steel so he owned the mines where you would go in and get the coal and get the iron he owned that and so he would hire workers but he didn't have to buy the coal or the iron from anybody else and then he owned the mills the place where you would um, heat up the iron and um, and make the steel and so he owned that part too so he wouldn't have to pay anybody to do that and then he also owned the railroads and the shipping lines to move that steel to wherever it was trying to go and so <clears throat> he because he owned every single one he made all the money from every single step it went to him and so he was able to put that back into the business and make it bigger and bigger and bigger and so by the end he was making more steel with his one company than all of the steel mills in England were making um, he also did good things with his money he was a philanthropist a philanthropist is a person who's really really rich but donates money to uh, people to make their life better he believed in something called the gospel of wealth and the gospel of wealth said i have a whole lot of money and i need to give it and and help other people out and so his quote that kind of shows what he meant by the gospel of wealth is he said i started life as a poor man and i wish to end it that way so he wanted to spend all of his money helping out other people if it was possible John D. Rockefeller also started off life as a poor man. He was the son of a peddler, so he was the son of someone who literally stood by the side of the road and tried to sell things to people. And what he did is he worked at an oil refinery for a while and he invested all of his money that he could get his hands on into trying to become part owner of an oil refinery. And <clears throat> he eventually became full owner of that oil refinery and he started to use the profits from it to buy up all the other oil companies okay and eventually he drove the other companies out of business and so his plan what he did is he decided that he was going to if he would either say he would say i will buy your company from you and if people would say no to him then he would slash the prices to really really low points where he wasn't making any money but he had so much money he could afford to lose money for a little bit whereas the small companies if they lost money for a little bit they'd go out of business and so he would slash the prices to really really low and make it so that the other companies couldn't afford to sell their stuff at that price and so they would have to quit and either sell the standard oil trust or they would have to go out of business and so with this tactic he created the standard oil trust and a trust is a group of companies that are run by the same board of directors so it's more than one company but there's the same owners who are running it and so basically they can set prices and decide where they want to be um, and so what this does is it eliminates competition and it lets them decide what price 
he should or he wants for his products okay and so a bunch of different businesses decided they wanted to follow that same model and so what that does though is it takes away the competition and so the people can charge the most the highest price that anybody would be willing to pay So people couldn't agree if it was a good thing or a bad thing to have these really rich businessmen. And so <clears throat> there are kind of two different ideas and two different schools of thought. And so the bad, the people who thought they were bad, they called them robber barons. Okay, And they said the robber barons were spending a bunch of time you know, taking away competition. And so it hurt free competition. And not only were they allowed to bring the prices way, way up, but they also used the money that they made and all their wealth that they had to influence politics. And so they could actually change the way that Congress was acting to make the rich even richer. Uh, the people that thought they were good, they called them captains of industry. And they thought if you're getting rid of competition, they're your, um, you know, costs of competing with other people and would go down and you could specialize and therefore the prices could actually get lower if you gave them the time to do that. Okay, and so they called them the captains of industry and they believed in something called social Darwinism, the people that liked this, uh, these really rich people. They thought, you know what, if we allow people to do their thing, then only the very, very strongest companies will survive and um, the weak ones will eventually die off and every single person will be better off because we're going to have these better com or companies. Um, so you can see the difference here just in these two pictures. You have captains of industry, which looks like a nice logo. And then this is a picture of these robber barons. And you can see they're sitting here with on Money Island just getting fat and eating whatever they want and enjoying themselves. And they're doing it on the backs of all these workers these workers are the ones that are holding them up and the workers are not getting anything out of it so it was a negative thing seen when they talked about robber barons uh, the workplace was a, another part where another piece of of history where there were a lot of problems at this time um, and the problems a lot of them were faced by women and children okay the women and children it seemed like got the most dangerous jobs whether it was in the coal mines or in the garment factories or anything like that okay um, and so <clears throat> what would often happen and you can see it in the picture right here Okay, is uh, children would get the jobs in these coal mines because they could fit into spaces that the full-grown men could not. And they also got the jobs in the garment factories because they could fit their hands back in the sewing machines uh, to clear it if it got jammed up or anything like that. Very, very dangerous, but it could only be done by small hands, which they had. Um, and so the women and the children in a lot of different industries like textiles, garments, tobacco, things like that, they outnumbered the men. There were more women and children working. Um, and <clears throat> a lot of times they were working in kind of bad conditions, things called sweatshops. A sweatshop is where you have uh, this, this spot where there are long hours and bad conditions and low pay and you're just making people work just because they need a job and you just uh, treat them poorly. And so really what it is is they, they give these people, because they're getting paid so little and spending so much time there, they're not given any chance to improve their lives or make it better. And so some of the dangers that they came up against was lung disease, and lung disease would happen because either the coal was floating around in the air and they'd get black lung for breathing that in all day. Or in a textile place, so where there's fabric, there are tiny little fibers that you can't even see floating around um, the air, and they would breathe these in, and it would agitate their lungs, and it could cause them to have lung cancer. All right, the other thing that was happening is at the steel mills, there was molten metal that they were working out, which caused, could cause really nasty burns or death. Um, another specific example that happened um, was the Triangle work, or Shirtwaist fi Fire. And the Triangle Shirtwaist fire happened at the Triangle Shirtwaist factory. And what was happening is the women were working on the top floor, but <clears throat> the managers didn't like some of the things that they were doing. They didn't want them to be able to leave early or take extra breaks or go to the stairway and smoke or anything like that. So what they did is they locked the doors. Every time that the women went up to work, they locked the doors. And what ended up happening is they locked the doors to the stairway 
and a fire happened. It was a terrible thing, and a fire happened um, on the top floors, and uh, the doors were locked. And so these women couldn't get out because the managers had left and gotten away as quick as they could because they didn't want to get burned up, and the women were stuck on the top floor. They had no way of getting anywhere else, and the fire was coming in. And so these women had to make terrible choices where – <clears throat> with the doors locked and the fire trucks there but the ladders were too short to come up and rescue them they had to decide whether to allow themselves to get burned up or to uh, jump out of the windows and hope that they survive but jumping from the top of this building resulted them dying so they either burned to death or they fell to their death and so <clears throat> the it ended up with about 150 women dying because of how bad the workplace conditions were. So the workers, realizing that they needed to improve conditions, started to organize, and they organized into labor unions. And a labor union is a group of workers that bands together um, to try and get better working conditions. Now, early, the uh, labor unions were not see as, seen as a positive thing. Uh, security guards were hired to try and break them up. They didn't want people organizing at all. They saw it as kind of a step towards communism. <clears throat> and so the working conditions they wanted to improve, improve, though, with this was to make workplaces safer, to increase wages, and to decrease hours as much as possible. And so um, they created the very first labor unions. And the first one that was a major labor union was called the Knights of Labor. And the Knights of Labor started out with a couple or a bunch of Philadelphia clothing workers. And they created this labor union. And this labor union allowed anybody in at all. So um, they had a couple of rules. And their rules were that they didn't strike. So they wouldn't say, we're not going to work because of X, Y, Z. So um, whatever it was, they would not go on strike at all. But what they did do is they got together and they had these rallies. They had these kind of protests about um, <clears throat> work conditions. And one of these such rallies happened at Haymarket Square. And at Haymarket Square, there was a union protest and a bomb went off right in the middle of it and ended up killing seven policemen and these seven policemen uh you know what ended up happening after that is the police started to spray the crowd with bullets and ended up killing a whole bunch of people and so um this went really really bad and public opinion went instantly against the unions because they always thought, already thought they were violent and so after haymarket square riot um the knights of labor kind of lost all of their influence And after the Knights of Labor were done, the uh, AFL came in in about 1886, and the AFL was the American Federation of Labor, and it was founded by this man. This man is Samuel Gompers. Uh, the di there was a little bit of a different thing about him um, or about this union. This union only allowed in skilled workers, so only people like... Uh, you know that had a job that they had to be trained in to be able to do you had to have some sort of skills some sort of education to be able to do and they thought they had more power with only allowing skilled workers in because it's really hard to train replacements and so um <clears throat> you know when they can't replace you you have a lot more power than when somebody can replace you and so they believed in something called collective bargaining and what collective bargaining is, is going in as a group to try and get a raise. Because if one person comes in and asks for a raise, then you can easily say no to them, no to them and say, well, leave if you want to, whatever. Okay. But if a whole group of people, if all of the teachers of higher ground came into Dr. Yigza and asked for a raise and said we were going to leave if he didn't give us all a raise, he'd have to, he'd almost have to listen to us and give us that raise because otherwise he'd have no teachers. He'd have to get a whole new staff for um, the school, right? And so that collective bargaining gives you more power. And then if that failed, if, if all else failed, then the AFL would definitely do strikes. They would walk out. 
on a business if they needed to. And so they quickly became the most powerful union, and they were a very powerful union. But the problem was they didn't really represent most of American workers. And so African Americans were not allowed in. Immigrants were not allowed into it. Um, unskilled laborers were not allowed into it. And so... They were really powerful, but they didn't represent everybody, and most people still saw the unions as a radical and violent um, <clears throat> thing. And one example of it, again, was uh, the Pullman uh, railroad cars. They made railroad cars, and what they did is they cut their pay by 25%. Um, and they didn't lower the rent on the houses that they made the people stay in, and so they charged them the same, but they cut their pay by 20%, and the public sided with the owners, and what ended up happening is the president of the United States actually sent troops to stop the union protest. So it kind of shows you that everybody was against these unions. They thought they were violent and not a good thing. So the cities were growing extremely fast, and they were growing in two different directions. They were growing out and getting bigger, and they were also growing up and getting taller and taller and taller. And so the growing out part, this happened mostly because of public transportation. Uh, a bunch of subway and rail systems and bus systems and things like that, elevated rails as well as you know underground ones, started to be built in one so a lot of the major cities and so what that did is it grew the suburbs people could now move from a really really long uh, ways away and they could come in to work um and so uh now that you can commu uh, commute not everyone has to live downtown you can have a yard you can have a nice house you can have all these different things and so at that point, the center of the town started to get really poor because these people couldn't afford to move to a new place. And as you moved away from the center of the city, it got richer and richer and richer to the edge of the suburbs. Um, they also grew up and... <clears throat> They grew up by building uh, skyscrapers, and so the very first skyscraper was built in Chicago. It was a 10-story building, and it was called a skyscraper because it seemed so high that it scraped the sky. And now we think of a 10-story building, and we've got more... We've got more than 10-story buildings within two blocks of our school, so it's not even a big deal. Uh, but by 1900... Uh, America had 30-story buildings, and we had electric elevators whirring up and down um, as you went. But there were some problems with living within the city, and, and a couple of them are, are outlined right here. The first one is tenement life. Uh, tenement life meant that you were living in these buildings that were divided into a lot of tiny apartments. And a lot of times it was no room in them, hardly any room at all. People are trying to live in these tiny little spaces, and they're really bad conditions. So you might have no windows or no heat or no indoor plumbing, so you had to go outside to go to the bathroom. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Another issue within the city was pollution. The streets, there was no garbage man. Nobody picked up the garbage, and so the streets were just covered in garbage. And so um, there was tons of disease, and high percentage of babies were dying because, you know, they were being exposed to this disease, and their immune systems are so much weaker when they're young. Um, another big problem was fire because the buildings were way too close together and they didn't have this, uh, you know, if they're made out of wood or whatever, they're easily flammable and they didn't have the same protections we have today. And so the people tried to help. The government tried to help. They put up, started to put up street lights to cut down on the crime. They created departments for fire to help out with, uh, you know, the fire department would come and try and put out fires for sanitation to pick up the trash and for police to protect people. And then there were groups, a lot of them religious groups, that would reach out to help the homeless people to try and survive and live life in a good way. However, not everything that was happening in the city was bad. Uh, some of it was really good, and one of these things was settlement houses. Settlement houses were being put up, to, uh, and they were centers to offer help to the poor people in the cities. Uh, Jane Addams was one of the people that created one of these settlement houses. She's up there, and it was called the Hull House, and the Hull House was a famous settlement house that was set up in Chicago to help poor women. 
And so what they were trying to do is help these single women to learn skills to get on their feet. Okay, And so the idea was to have or to train these women so that they could have independent success, success all by themselves without uh, the man being part of it. There was also a lot of excitement within the cities that was happening. Um, for example, in department stores uh, were a brand new thing. And these are stores where you could get literally everything in, in one store like uh, Walmart or something like that because before you had a separate store for shoes, a separate store for food, a separate store for meat, a separate store. I mean, every single place had a separate store for it. And so instead, now they had these department stores where you could get anything and everything that you needed. <clears throat> Uh, there were also within the cities a lot of entertainment opportunities with museums and art galleries and theaters and you know they were starting to build these green spaces like parks and zoos right in the middle of the city so people could experience that kind of stuff no matter where they were living. Um, at the same time also James Naismith was uh, working at a YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts and it was the winter and um, people were tired because they didn't have anything to do to work out. They didn't have a fun game to play. And so all he had was a soccer ball and an old soccer ball. And so he had this gym. And so what he did is he saw these two peach baskets sitting over in the corner from some fruit that they had eaten. And so what he did is he knocked the bottom out of them and he nailed them up to, on the wall. And so, um, what he asked people to do is he said, take this old soccer ball and try and throw it into those hoops. And it quickly became a very, very popular sport and developed in the sport that we call basketball today. So James Naismith was the inventor of basketball just with this old soccer ball and a couple of peach baskets. Um, football was also becoming really popular and it, it, there was during one college season in 1944 it was very dangerous because all they had was leather helmets they didn't have the pads and everything and they were hitting each other uh, but in one season 44 college players died from injuries that they sustained on the field so the immigrants were also coming in at this time, and about it was a large number. About 25 million people came into the country uh, between 1865 and 1915. So in that 50-year year period of time, there were about 25 million people coming in. And they were coming in because of push factors from their other country. There are things that make people want to leave their country. A push factor is something that makes you want to leave your country. And the push factors that were happening at this time were farmland shortage because <clears throat> in Europe there was they were running out of land because they had so many people so you couldn't get your own farm and the people that were just working on the farms the machines were very quickly replacing them because one person could plow a whole field much faster than before when you had to have individuals pick it uh, second thing was religious persecution um, the Jews were one group that was being run out of everywhere they went, and so they tried to find a new place where there was religious freedom, like America, where they could um, <clears throat> live the way that they wanted to, as well as the Armenian Christians who were being run out um, and actually you know, dealing with genocide. People were killing all of the Christians in Armenia. Um, last was political unrest and war. There was a lot of revolution happening in different countries in Europe, and the revolution in Mexico was causing a lot of the Mexicans to run away from that area because it was becoming so violent, and um, <clears throat> people were just tired of it. The other things that were happening were pull factors. So uh, push factors pushed them out of their old country, but pull factors were the things that pulled them in or brought them into America. So a pull factor is things that make people want to come to America. And things that made people want to come here were the religious freedom. We had religious freedom. You could be in a religion you wanted to and you wouldn't get in trouble for it. We had economic opportunities. You could make a new business. You, there were no rules that said because you're this race or whatever you can't do whatever okay uh, there was also cheap land as a matter of fact there was free land if you were willing to farm it for five years and just the freedom itself all of these things put together um, create this idea of the American dream the reason that immigrants came over then and still the reason that immigrants come to this country even today 
And so the immigrants who came over here, a lot of them had to deal with some pretty nasty conditions. Um, many of them were put into steerage, and steerage is a large compartment on the bottom of the ship, okay, down in the hole of the ship, that is used to hold most often cattle. So cows are usually moved over in it, but they would move humans. And But because that was all that those people could afford was a way to get down there. But they were packed in so tight that there was a lot of disease and people were getting sick, okay? And then <clears throat> they would get sick and all of a sudden they'd pull up to these places like Ellis Island, which is a picture of right here. It's that middle picture. And then Angel Island down here. Ellis Island is in New York City. And anybody who was coming from Europe, anyone who was coming from the east, would <clears throat> come from or have to go through Ellis Island to get into the United States. Anybody who was coming from the west would go through San Francisco on Angel Island. And on either of these islands, they had to complete a couple of different things. They had to do an interview and talk about why they were there. But they also had to do a physical exam, and so a doctor would come and would check them out, and if they were disabled or if they were seen as majorly ill, then they would they were just sent home. They said, you can't come in here, you can't be here. And um, like I said, they did an interview to make sure that they were here for the right reasons and not here you know, trying to disrupt the country or something like that. Um, the immigrants that came in, about two-thirds of them lived in cities, and most of them would move to cities where there were a lot of people that were like them. And so uh, they lived in neighborhoods based on their culture. There would be an Irish part of town, and there would be you know, a Jewish part of town, and things like that. Just like <clears throat> where... Minneapolis has become a place where a lot of Somali people live or where a lot of Hmong people live. You move to places where there are other people like you so that you have someone that shares your same culture, your same language. You have all of these things. It's very common for immigrants to do that so that they can feel that safety as if they were back in their home country. And so these immigrants were asked to essentially become American, and they were asked to assimilate with the culture of America. Assimilate means you need to change yourself to become part of another culture, to become like another culture. And so the fastest people to assimil assimilate at any time are children. They quickly learn the language. They quickly turn you know, their cultural aspects into it because their culture is still building, being built at that time. So when they're seeing everybody else doing it, they really take it in. And they're able to embody the American dream. They're able to become part of the American dream. And so these parents, they want their kids to have a better life than they have. And so these parents feel this pride, but they also feel, because their next generation will be better off, but they also feel the pain because um, their kids are losing the culture from their mother country. And so these immigrants came in and they started to take the hard jobs. They started, they built the railroads, they built the subways, the skyscrapers, they were laying down railroad tracks. They built America. Okay, the immigrants really built the entire country. Um, and as they're doing this, they're also bringing in parts of their culture. And so there's new food and new clothing and new games and all kinds of different stuff as they're slowly adding little bits of their culture um, to America. And as you can see here, adding to the melting pot. Okay, They're adding their own little thing. So they're becoming American, but they're also adding their own little flavor to the soup that is America. However, if there are immigrants, there will always be nativists, and nativists are people who want to preserve America for native-born Americans. And what they meant by this is the white people who were actually born in America. So they didn't actually mean the Native Americans, but they just meant the white people um, who had been around for a while. And they said they were old immigrants, but they said these new immigrants, they won't assimil assimilate. They just didn't trust them to be become part of the American culture. And they said they also take our jobs jobs and you know the immigrants are all into this anarchist movement which means they're all against they're against every single government they don't like the idea of any government and so they started to associate with them with violence and crime and so the one group that was most picked on by the nativists was the chinese and it got to the point where even the government was picking on them. When the government put in 1882, they created the Chinese Exclusion Act. And they basically said, no new immigrants are allowed to come in from China um, 
<clears throat> forever. And so this lasted from 1882 all the way up till 1943. And in 1917, another uh, Exclusion Act was put in for all countries in 1917. And they said, if you cannot read in your own language, uh, read and write, then you're not allowed to come into the country either. And so they were really having high requirements for these immigrants to be able to come into the country, <clears throat> trying to protect them from having the wrong kind of immigrants.